Welcome back. Today we're going to be finishing the David Ferry Winterland trip. And when we get done with that, we're going to continue through the remainder of the David Ferry files from Jim Garrison's file. So, without further ado, uh, we talked yesterday about the trip to the Winterland and we went over the relationship between Lyndon Johnson, Mary Boots Roberts, Vincent Caltagrone Jr., Jack Valenti, Jack Valenti's sister, right? So um, David Ferry never went to the Winterland. Um, it was done to create an alibi for Ferry, and it was actually Sergio Arcacha Smith who went to the Winterland posing as David Ferry for said purpose of creating an alibi. So the question then becomes, what did David Ferry really do? So the reality is that David Ferry was in Dallas. He flew into Dallas in his plane on the 20th of November into Fort Worth. We know this because of the statements of Jack Martin. Um, David Ferry was also one of two shooters on the grassy knoll. David Ferry fired the first shot that struck Kennedy in the throat. Um, he is then seen behind the book depository by a witness named Velma speaking to J.D. Tippett. He is then involved in the shooting of J.D. Tippett with Kerry Thornley, not Oswald. So uh, from there, after he shoots Tippett in the head as the second Tippett shooter, uh, he then flees. He ends up at some point at the uh, address on Belmont in Fort Worth, where his uh, light-colored Ford Falcon station wagon is waiting for him. And so he then flees from Dallas the evening of the 22nd, and he goes to Hammond, Louisiana. So, let us begin with the documents. So, check Pat Kirkwood, Fort Worth, reputed vice lord of Fort Worth and close friend of Jack Ruby. Check the Daily Star, Hammond, Louisiana, supposedly a graduate student, presumably southeastern, says Ferry hid out the night of the assassination in a dorm room in Hammond. There is an airport in Hammond, also the home of Shaw's mother. Athletic, athletic director Grady Martin might have some info. Uh, no, Grady Martin doesn't have any info. Uh, I've scoured the internet looking for any info from Grady Martin. There is none, so we can just ignore that. Uh, but this person, this student, uh, and we'll get to that student's identity uh, here momentarily, says Ferry hid out in Hammond the night of the assassination. Now, what is the official story and what does Ferry say happened? Ferry says that he left from New Orleans at around, you know, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. He doesn't know because he doesn't fucking remember because he wasn't there, right? But allegedly he left at between 6 and 9 o'clock, ends up 4.30 in the morning in Houston, and he stays at the Alamo Hotel in Houston, which is directly next to the Gateway, right? So um, that's what he says. But here now we start to have some contradiction. We start to have uh, a student at Hammond stating that Ferry spent the night there. Um, let's read some of the statement from Thomas Compton. Now, Thomas Compton was another Civil Air Patrol guy that uh, David Ferry had indoctrinated in the years before. Um, he is currently going to the University at Southeastern in Hammond. Um, and so we're going to go over these next couple statements. And we're going to, so this will absolutely prove that not only was David Ferry not in Houston at all, that he was actually in Hammond, Louisiana, but that it was planned in advance for him to go to Hammond, Louisiana. Okay, and that Thomas Compton is a fucking liar when we go through this statement. So Mr. Thomas Compton continued to state that on Sunday after the assassination at 5.30 a.m. Okay, let's pause right here. Sunday after the assassination at 5.30 a.m. That would be the morning of the 24th. Okay, the morning of the 24th, meaning it became Sunday at midnight and now it's 5.30 in the morning on the 24th. He was awakened by David Ferry in his dormitory bed at the University of Southeastern in Hammond, Louisiana. Mr. Compton stated that until this day, he is uncertain how David Ferry located him on this date. At this time, Dave Ferry was in hysterics and in near tears as he stated, the police are at my home and they've taken some of my things. Compton stated that David Ferry did not elaborate on my things and stated that Ferry also related he didn't do anything wrong. The two talked for a while on different unrelated subjects and then Ferry made two calls to New Orleans and Compton believed they were to G. Ray Gill, attorney at law. 
Compton stated that Dave Ferry left at approximately 8.30 a.m. the same morning, and it is believed he returned to New Orleans in a Ford Falcon station wagon painted light blue. Compton stated that Dave Ferry did not tell him that he had been to Texas. Compton stated he had never met Lee Harvey Oswald, and also that he could not connect him in any way to the CAP. The only knowledge Oswald of Oswald was from Mr. Bill Wolf, who headed the New Orleans Astronomers Club. So, the Mr. Bill Wolf thing I'll have to get into one day. I haven't really dug too much into that. Kind of irrelevant, but once again, I think it's an incident involving Carrie Thornley, not Oswald. Uh, so, okay, let's break down this statement and point out where it's fucking wrong, okay? So the first paragraph, he's talking about Dave is in hysterics, right? So if Dave's in hysterics because the cops are at his house and they've taken some of his things, well, that would have to have been Monday, not Sunday, because that was just after midnight going into the 25th. So Compton's statement here is bullshit. He's giving the wrong day or he's just lying about the day because there's no way that David Ferry could have showed up at his place at 5.30 in the morning uh, complaining about his things. Now, I do believe that David Ferry showed up at his place at 5.30 in the morning Sunday, but that was after he'd already been there since Friday night. So, let's continue. Now, in my opinion, the single best witness statement in all of the Kennedy assassination is this one right here. This is my favorite because this completely debunks uh, the David Ferry trip to Houston, shows that he was actually in Hammond all fucking weekend, with the exception of a trip down Saturday night to Galveston, to meet with Sergi Arcacha, Leighton Martins, and Alvin Boboof to check them into the hotel. Hence, the blue Ford Falcon station wagon painted light blue is checked in and the license plate number with David Ferry's light blue Mercury Comet is now attached to the light blue Ford Falcon. And it is checked in at Galveston at 11 o'clock at night. Okay, that is that Saturday. But let me go over the statement from Frank J. Chalona, who was like the fucking superstar witness of all time in the Kennedy assassination, and why um, every other single Kennedy researcher in the fucking world has not looked into this when this is right in Jim Garrison's file. If fucking Kennedy researchers haven't read every page of Jim Garrison's file, what are you doing? Um, so this is the absolute proof David Ferry never went to fucking Houston, and yet I seem to be the only person pointing this shit out. In the fall of 1963, my roommate was Thomas Compton. We were residing in Holloway Smith Hall, Southeastern Louisiana College. I think that on approximately November 22nd or 23rd, he told me that a friend of his would be staying in our room. Okay, so Chelona doesn't know the exact date, um, but it's either, you know, it's, it's either the day before the assassination or the assassination day itself. He's told by Thomas Compton that a friend is going to be staying in their room. Okay, so there, that alone debunks Thomas Compton's statement that he doesn't know how David Ferry found him that night. He just showed up randomly out of the fucking blue. No, uh, it was planned in advance and Thomas Compton's a fucking liar. I think that on approximately November 22nd or 23rd, he told me that a friend of his would be staying in our room. The reason for this person staying was said so that he could be where many people could see him. Okay, so they had planned on Hammond being the, the alibi, but that went the way of the dodo, right? That changed at some point, and I don't know why. And I don't know why this was originally planned for him to be there so he could be seen. But just the fact that he was there to be seen is indicative of him creating an alibi in Hammond. But that never came to fruition, did it? I was told his name was Dave. I don't remember for certain whether I was ever told his last name. I was told that he was a psychologist. On the 23rd of November in the afternoon, or perhaps the evening, I went to my room and found the man sleeping in my roommate's bed. Stop the presses. On the 23rd, that's Saturday, of November in the afternoon, or perhaps the evening... I went to my room and found my, the man sleeping in my roommate's bed. Where's David Ferry supposed to be November 23rd in the afternoon or early evening? He's supposed to be at the Winterland from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. He's supposed to then leave there and go to a restaurant on Telephone Road. And he then drives to Galveston, allegedly. But no, we have Frank J. Chalona putting David Ferry in his dormitory in the early evening or afternoon on the 23rd. That one highlighted paragraph completely fucking upends and debunks the entire official story, everything David Ferry says, and it fucking also puts, shines a light on people like James DiEugenio and Greg Parker and all these other fucking cocksuckers who haven't been able to figure out shit in 40 fucking years. Okay, why haven't they pointed this out? If you can't tell, I have a great disdain for Kennedy researchers because I shouldn't have had to spend the last five years of my fucking life doing this. Should have been doing something else. 
Let me read this paragraph again because I fucking love it so much. On the 23rd of November in the afternoon or perhaps the evening, I went to my room and found the man sleeping in my roommate's bed. His back was to me, so I couldn't see his face at the time. I noticed, however, that he was sleeping fully clothed and with his hat on. At this time, I also noticed that his hair was very strange looking. I believe that I was introduced to him later on in the evening, but I don't remember the nature of the introduction or what was said, except that not much was said at all. I've asked my roommate about this man, and in particular about his hair. I was told that he was bald, and that he pasted theatrical hair at the point where his hat met his head. Come on, who, who are we talking about here? We're talking about David Ferry. Who else is in, this, in the cast of characters who that just fits? Nobody. I'm not certain that he spent the entire night in the room, or that he even spent more than a few hours in the early evening. The next time I saw him was Sunday morning in the lobby of the dormitory. It was very crowded as everyone was watching the funeral on television. I believe I saw him. I don't believe I saw him anymore after Sunday morning. Later that day, my roommate told me David gone back home. I don't know how he got home. Perhaps my roommate drove him. Okay, so remember, uh, Thomas Compton says that David Ferry shows up 530 in the morning Sunday and that he left a couple hours later, 830 in the morning. But that's not true. Um, we know by the official story that David Ferry spent Sunday night in Hammond and that he returned from Hammond Monday morning, not Sunday morning. Uh, and then he met, went and met Jim Garrison, right? And Jim Garrison uh, had him locked up for interrogation. So David Ferry shoots Kennedy on the knoll and he does all this shit with the Winterland and then he goes back to New Orleans and he is busted by Jim Garrison. He was interviewed by the Secret Service, the FBI, everybody, right? So that's how close they came to get to, to, to completely, um, you know, bringing forth the truth of the assassination within a couple days. Like, it was right there. They had Ferry in custody. It's unfortunate it took so many years for all this stuff to come out. At a later date, my roommate disclosed to me that he had either known or had heard of Lee Harvey Oswald through the Civil Air Patrol, of which he had been a member for a short time. The rest of the stuff up here I put because I thought it was interesting. Uh, up top is from the phone book. David Ferry is listed as a psychologist. And remember, it said here that he believed his name was Dave and he was a psychologist, right? So uh, that all checks out. It's definitely David Ferry, and it was definitely the 23rd of November that he was seen there. Um, let me see. So this is Ferry's actual timeline. Uh, Ferry's in Fort Worth on November 20th, as per Jack Martin. Uh, he's in Dallas on November 22nd, uh, 63, where he's a shooter on the Knoll, and he is a shooter of Tippett. Ferry then hit out in Hammond the night of November 22nd, as per the Garrison Memo. Remember, the Garrison Memo says that a student said that he hit out that night. So he's there in Hammond. Chalona sees Ferry sleeping on Saturday, 11 23, 63, in the afternoon or evening in Hammond, and this confirms Ferry never went to Houston. Um, he then goes to the Driftwood, and checks in at 11 p.m. Remember, so they're checked in at two places on the 23rd. And just to recap why they're checked in two places on the 23rd, because you had multiple groups of people moving throughout Texas at this time. Uh, one of the groups was Sergio Akacha with Leighton Martins and Alvin Bobuf. That's the three kids who allegedly went to the Winterland and all that stuff. Uh, Akacha impersonating David Ferry. But the second group of people who was obviously using the motel in uh, Galveston on the, or in, uh, in Houston on the 23rd, the Alamo Motel, was Jack Ruby, Candy Barr, and Andrew Jerome Blackman. And that's why that was left open, because David, uh, because Jack Ruby had to bring Blackman back to his boat at the port at Galveston, which left on Monday. Andrew Blackman is then interrogated on Tuesday by his commanding officers in the merchant marine and i'm sure the fbi and all that stuff but all that documentation has been fucking hidden because anybody who's really a part of this thing all their documents are gone like lawrence howard and lauren hall and motherfucking william seymour there are no files in the jim garrison collection about them but yet they are implied or inferred about in almost every goddamn fucking document he has right so uh, tons of shit is missing so Thomas Compton puts Ferry and Hammond at 5.30 a.m. Sunday, 11.24 until 8.30. And that, to me, is perfect timing, not because the police were at David Ferry's house, but because Thomas, Com Thomas Compton puts him there at 5.30, which means that David Ferry had driven Saturday. 
after Frank J. Chalona sees him in the dormitory bed in the evening or early afternoon, or no, I'm sorry, in the afternoon or early evening, he then leaves from Hammond, drives down to Galveston, where he meets up with Sergio Arcacha, Leighton Martins, Alvin Bobov, and he checks them into the Driftwood. Okay. That's on the 23rd. And then the drive back from Galveston to Hammond, Louisiana, puts uh, David Ferry back in Hammond at about 530 in the morning on Sunday. Now, uh, what did he do on Sunday? I don't really know. He hung out somewhere around there all day on Sunday. And then he do- and then he goes back Monday, right? So I don't even believe the story of him dropping off the kids at the at his apartment, 3330 Louisiana Parkway in New Orleans. Don't, bu- don't buy that at all. He was in Hammond the whole time. Sergio Arcacha had to drop the kids off because then Sergio Arcacha drives back to fucking Houston, right? Because I think he needs to get to Dallas because he lives in Dallas at this time. And he fucking uh, then leaves from when they check out at the... Uh, Alamo Motel on the 24th in the evening, and then he heads back up to Dallas. That's kind of what I put together there. I haven't been able to work out Jack Ruby's movements, but when you look at Jack Ruby in the hallway of the police department, that's not Jack Ruby. And when you look at Jack Ruby in the midnight press conference, again, not Jack Ruby. That is his almost identical brother, Samuel Ruby. Uh, Samuel Ruby impersonated Jack all over that fucking weekend. Half the fucking incidents of people interacting with Jack Ruby over the weekend of the 23rd and 24th in Dallas was not fucking Jack Ruby. It was Samuel Ruby. And Samuel Ruby had been living in Dallas for at least a year and a half before the assassination. And when you come to understand the different people who knew Jack Ruby and the different descriptions of Jack Ruby, once again, very clear, they're describing two different people. Um, One was a hothead who would kick your ass in two seconds. uh, And the other one was a super sweet guy, possibly gay, connected to all the people down in New Orleans, right? So, yeah, I'm gonna. There's not any information on Samuel Ruby. It's about 15 pages of fucking documents, and that's all you'll ever find. But make no mistake about it: the photograph of Jack Ruby in the hallway of the police department is not Jack Ruby. It's Samuel Ruby, and the same applies for the midnight press conference. So, and and that being the case, being that Samuel Ruby corrected the reporters when they named the Fair Play for Cuba committee, that would imply that Samuel Ruby was in the know on everything about Oswald, the whole nine yards. Hell. Samuel Ruby may have been Jack Ruby, and Jack Ruby may have been the fucking nobody hang around, not the other way around. We don't know. So where are we at here? All right, so with this information, at about shortly after midnight, these officers went to 3330 Louisiana Avenue Parkway. This is, in the, this is on the Monday. This is on the Monday after midnight, right? Um... So, uh, knocked on the door, and the same was opened by a subject who identified himself as Alvin Bobuf. The officers requested the present whereabouts of David Ferry. Bobuf said he didn't know. It was obvious that he was trying to conceal the facts. He was placed under arrest, and the officers went to the second-story apartment where they found Leighton Martin seated in a chair. The subject was questioned, and he stated that he was uh, presently living with Ferry. However, uh, he did not know the present whereabouts of Ferry. Martin's, too, was placed under arrest, and the officers instituted a search in this residence we found uh, a smith and wesson 38 caliber with a five inch barrel six shot revolver but number 85392 cylinder number blah 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 a holster for the revolver 22 caliber hamilton rifle and a large bore uh, blah 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 whatever that says and so another thing they found at carry at uh, david ferry's house was they found a box with a whole bunch of pubic hairs in it right so he collected pubic hairs from the kids that he were hanging out with him and there is some speculation that he was actually taking those pubic hairs and he was using them to paste over his eyebrows, <laughs> right? Like, so, yeah, he was a sick, sick motherfucker. So where are we going to go with this now? Okay, so, yeah, I think that's pretty much covers uh, everything in regards to um, the the Winterland. So in summary, um, David Ferry was the shooter and he ended up going to Hammond, Louisiana, while Sergio Arcacha Smith brought the two boys, Alvin Bobuf and Leighton Martins, using the alias of Melvin Coffee to the Winterland, uh, where they then met with Rulon Roland, not Roland Chuck Roland, and then Rulon Roland happens to be married to Joyce Roland, who was actually um, Mary Boots Roberts, must have been after she got divorced from Ronnie Roberts. Um, and then, what what is there? And then, uh, yeah, so that's the whole thing. It was a CIA child trafficking front owned by Lyndon Johnson, um, connected to Jack Valenti, Raul, the whole nine yards. So yeah, the Winterland is like the fucking key to the whole Kennedy assassination. Most certainly. Um, so now we're going to continue along with some more of the David Ferry files um, from Garrison. 
This is a 328 page file. You can see the URL up top if you'd like to follow along. Uh, this is pretty interesting. This is a um, this is a statement, a summary of a statement from a woman named uh, Clara Flournoy Bootsy Gay. Uh, it's pretty interesting. It's, it's a little tidbit, but um, you know, the assassination is made of a whole bunch of tidbits. So here we go. In answer to a subpoena, Bootsy Gay came into the office on this date at about 2.45 p.m. She stated to Soul and Mr. James Alcock that she resided at 528 Dumain Street and is employed at Max Hill's Painting Suppliers, located at 629 uh, Street, Peter Street. Oh, St. Peter Street. Telephone 5239302. She stated that just prior to the assassination, she was having G. Ray Gill do some legal work of a civil nature for her. She made several trips to Gill's office and observed David Ferry, who had an office at Gill's office, and she understood that Ferry was an investigator for Gill. The day following the John Kennedy assassination, a Saturday, she, Mrs. Gay, went to Gill's office and observed that two female employees were cleaning out Ferry's desk. One of those had to have been Alice Guidros. Uh, she saw a chart or a sketch, and what caught her eye was the fact that this chart had Elm written on it and what appeared to be a street. There was also a building, and on the street was a square with the letters VIP written in this square. Mrs. Gay stated that she remarked to the receptionist that this should be turned over to the FBI. The receptionist then picked it off the desk and threw it in the trash can, stating it was nothing. Mrs. Gay stated that she took the document from the trash can, stating that she would give it to the FBI. The receptionist then grabbed the document from Mrs. Gay's hand and threw it in the trash again. Mrs. Gay seemed to be about 60 years old, reasonably intelligent, slightly nervous, and very cooperative. She appears to be the type of individual who likes to see justice prevail. So, interesting. She goes to G. Ray Gill's office. They're cleaning out Ferry's desk. Why are they cleaning out Ferry's desk? He was employed there as of the day before, but the next day, on the day after the assassination, um, with only, what, one or two phone calls to Gill from um, the Houston trip, right? But those calls never co connected. They couldn't have connected because Dave Ferry wasn't fucking there. Right. So uh, the very next day, they're, they're starting to disavow any knowledge of David Ferry by getting rid of all his shit. Uh, and the piece of paper had Elm written on it in a square with VIP. Interesting. Interesting. Direct connection to Dealey Plaza. And the thing is, like, unless you believe that Bootsy Gay is lying. You know, then how, then, wh what are you talking about? All right, so um, we're going to talk about Jules Rico Kimball a little bit. Um, Jules Rico Kimball, fucking fascinating guy, connected to JFK assassination people, Martin Luther King assassination people. Um, I've read all the J Jules Rico Kimball documents, but I haven't really uh, analyzed them too much. You know, there's a difference between just reading stuff and then going back and analyzing. So uh, Jules Rico Kimball, one day I'll get to, probably when I get to Martin Luther King, which is not really on my horizon anytime soon. Jack Valenti most likely shot Martin Luther King. We know that probably because of the relationship to Raul, who was his former brother-in-law and probably lifelong spotter. So uh, that being said, Jules Rico Kimball, just so we're clear, um, uh, as uh, we'll go through this in the document, he calls himself a fink for the feds. He was working with FBI, CIA, you know, all the three-letter agencies as an undercover informant. So um, I met David Ferry in early 1960 in a bar room named the Golden Lantern in the French Quarter. I would see Dave from time to time in the same bar, and I flew with him in his airplane on several occasions. One night while drinking in the Golden Lantern, Dave introduced me to Clay Shaw. I was with Clay Shaw and Dave for several hours that night, which was in late 60 or early 61. From that time on, I used to see Clay Shaw on different occasions, you know, drinking and so forth. One day in late 61 or early 62, I received a phone call from Dave, and he asked me if I would like to take an overnight plane trip with him. I said, all right, and then met Ferry at the airport, at which time I found out that Clay Shaw was coming with us. At this time, I also found out that we were going to Canada to pick up, to pick someone up. No other explanation was given. While on the trip, Clay Shaw sat in the back of the airplane reading books and slept. Shaw also had a brown briefcase with him. On the flight, we stopped at different places to gas up and stretch our legs. We stopped in Nashville, Tennessee, Louisville, Kentucky, and Toronto, Canada. Our final stop was in Montreal, Canada. Ferry and myself stayed in a hotel overnight. I believe it might have been the Hilton Air or something like that. The hotel was located at Dorval, which was right outside of Montreal. Clay Shaw disappeared after we landed, and I did not see him until the next morning, which was about 8 o'clock, when we were ready to leave to come back to New Orleans. When Shaw arrived at the plane, he had, his he had his Mexican or Cuban with him. 
This guy was kind of heavy set, dark complexion, balding in the front in his early 30s or middle 30s. He sat in the back of the airplane with Shaw and spoke only to Shaw in broken English. The airplane uh, that we used was a Cessna 172, which I believe belonged to a friend of Ferry's. We, brought, uh, we bought our gas with a Gulf credit card, which Ferry had. Uh, when we got back to the lakefront airport, I got into my automobile and Ferry and Shaw and other guy got into the automobile and left. About a month or two later, I got another phone call from Ferry asking if I wanted to make another return trip with him to Canada, but I told him no. I've seen Shaw on different occasions in bar rooms at the International Trademark up until the time that the District Attorney's Office started their investigation. I've heard other people introduce Clay Shaw as Clay Bertrand, but he had never been introduced to me as Clay Bertrand. I'd also like to state that about two or three weeks after David Ferry died, I got a phone call from Jack Helms. All right, so before we get into the Jack Helms stuff, which is an alias, 100 fucking percent, um, we're going to go back and we're going to review some of what is said here because a lot of this has a lot of relevance. So David Ferry is talking about Clay Shaw going with him up to Montreal, Canada. Now, why would they be going to Montreal, Canada? Well, Clay Shaw obviously... Uh, sat on the board of directors of Central Mondial Commercial, a subsidiary of Permindex, of which he also sat on the board of directors, which was a Mo Mossad front company. Okay, um, I kind of see Permindex as being the oversight board of the assassination, right? Once the decision was made by the Mossad, it went to the oversight board of Permindex, which was a compilation of mafia, Mossad, CIA, uh, Corsican mafia. They had all kinds of motherfuckers in Permindex, right? Gershon Perez, a bunch of fucking Israelis. Um, so from there, uh, the, the money then gets funneled through Central Mondial Commercial, um, but also some of the money came from the Las Vegas skim, but, uh, that's basically how it goes. It went from the Mossad to Permindex to the money went to CMC and then it got funneled down to whoever got paid. And sitting on the board of directors of CMC was Clay Shaw and a guy named Louis Bloomfield. Louis Bloomfield, uh, was living in Montreal. Like anytime you hear about the Kennedy assassination in Montreal, just think Louis Bloomfield. 100% of the time. Uh, there's no other connection to Montreal other than like the Montreal Mafia and the Montreal Mafia, they like, I don't even know that they played a role, but like um, you had a bunch of uh, Corsicans come into town. Uh, they were identified by Hank Elborelli in his newest book, Coup in Dallas. Um, they were not assassins, but the, they flooded Dealey Plaza with known assassins so that when the investigation took off, they would see 30 assassins walking around Dealey Plaza, which is probably about how many there were. Um, and, uh, but the Montreal Mafia was only involved in as far as contacts with the Corsicans when they came into Montreal, then crossed into New York, and then ended up in Texas. That's how the Corsicans went down. But they were just there to muddy the waters. They didn't shoot nobody. So, um, let me see. Okay, so the trip is important. Uh, the mention of the trip by Jules Rigo Kimball is super important because when you go through the, the, the Clay Shaw documents, you'll find um, the trip to Montreal that involved Lambert and Diaz um and Heidel, right? Okay, so let's go back to these aliases again. Um, the trips that were made to Montreal and flown by David Ferry with the alias Heidel, you can guarantee that was Carrie Thornley. Um, the Lambert alias, definitely Clay Shaw. And Sergio Arcacha Smith used Herminio Diaz as an alias. So a lot of people in the Kennedy will come across Herminio Diaz and they'll try to associate him with the alleged Negro that's seen in Dealey Plaza. That's false. That's uh, Herminio Diaz is dead at this point, if I'm not fucking mistaken, but the name was being used by Arcacha as an alias. So anytime you come across Herminio Diaz, just think Sergio Arcacha Smith. That's all you need to know. Um, so this is important because this shines a light on that important incident with Lambert and fucking Diaz, right? Because the Spanish speaker with the broken accent is clearly Sergio Arcacha. Um, that becomes obvious when you come to understand the relationships involved here, right? Keep harping on relationships. They tell you way more than anything you'll ever find in Dealey Plaza. All right, let me get to the Jack, right, the Jack Helms stuff. Um, make it known here, Jack Helms is an alias. I have a feeling it might be Jean-Pierre Lafitte, uh, but that is one of those things I'll probably never be able to prove. Um, I would also like to state that about two or three weeks after David Ferry died, I got a phone call from Jack Helms, who was formerly with the federal government and later connected to the Ku Klux Klan, asking me if I would take a ride with him by Ferry's house to pick up some papers. I said yes, and a short while later, he picked me up at my house in a 1966 white Chevrolet. We drove to Ferry's house and parked a little way down the block. Jack got out of the automobile with a flashlight and appeared that he went around the back of the house or into the backyard. A short while later, he came back with a black briefcase and got into the automobile, at which time we drove off. 
Later, I believe that the contents of this briefcase were put into a safety deposit box at the Bank of Louisiana. Later, I believe these papers were removed from the Bank of Louisiana and put into a big black box in St. Bernard Parish, which belonged to the Klan. The fellow who kept this box is called Otto. I do not know him by any other name. I believe these papers were then removed from this black box, but I don't know where they were removed to. I did manage to get some papers from this black box, but they pertain to the Klan, and I turned these papers to Clement Hood, an FBI agent I was working for. I also had contact with CIA agents, their names being Steinmeier, who has since been transferred to Texas, and Nat Brown, who is still in New Orleans, and another guy by the name of Red, last name unknown. I used, uh, uh, okay, so I need to point this out. If you haven't been watching this show for very long, well, it's only been on for three fucking weeks, but back, if you go back and you watch through the first, like, you know, 10 hours of Kerry Thornley videos that I fucking did, you'll find that Kerry Thornley had a known contact named Red in New Orleans, CIA. So it's probably the same guy. So now we have a, a loose connection uh, between uh, Jules Rico Kimball and Kerry Thornley. I mean, if you think there were multiple CIA agents working in fucking New Orleans named Red, then hey, sure, it could be somebody different. Odds are, no. So, hence my conclusion. Uh, I used to have meetings uh, with the agents in different motel rooms where I would give them reports, pictures, recordings, etc., and would also receive my paycheck or cash, which I would sign a voucher for, and would also receive further instructions. They would mail different things to me at my post office box number, which is 7013052 Lafayette Street Branch. Okay. All right, all right, this is another one. <clears throat> Several months ago, Rick Townley with WDSU called me. Let's stop right there. There's no fucking Rick Townley. There isn't. I've, I've looked, I've checked. There was a Rick Townley with WDSU, but I'm telling you with certainty that is Kerry Thornley using an alias. And this is the connection to Walter Sheridan that I had mentioned yesterday. Okay? When you go back to Atsugi and you look into Oswald at Atsugi in Japan, you will find statements of a Marine who met a photographer at Atsugi whose name was Rick Thornley. Okay? That to me showed Kerry Thornley using an alias of Rick Thornley was posing as a photographer in 1959 at Atsugi to take pictures of Oswald and Oswald's uh, group. Now, when you go back to New Orleans and WDSU, you will never find a Rick Townley photograph ever. And you will find that Kerry Thornley did actually do some journalism going back to 1960 in New Orleans. So, hence two and two equals four, always. Um, this Rick Townley at WDSU who called him, I promise you, is Kerry Thornley. Um, that will be able to be proven once I do more work on Kerry Thornley and connecting Thornley's aliases, including Rick Townley and Rick Thornley. But that's years to come and it's not on my, high on my agenda. Uh, I asked him how he found out that I had them and he said it didn't matter. He asked me if I would meet some uh, meet some place and I told him yes, to come over to my house. He said no, he wouldn't do that, uh, that it would have uh, to be someplace public. So I met him at the Copper Kitchen in Tulane Avenue. Now, let's just remember this. The Copper Kitchen on Tulane Avenue. Now, if we go back to the Kerry Thornley files and we find Kerry Thornley making any references whatsoever to the Copper Kitchen, then I will be able to connect this statement by uh, Jules Rico Kimball and Kerry Thornley's statements regarding the Copper Kitchen. Okay? Um, it is a small world. And when you go through these documents, you see how just, just how small the world actually is. After we talked for a while, I went home and put on a suit and we went down to WDSU and we got the WDSU Townley called Walter Sheridan in New York. And I sat there while Townley talked to Sheridan. OK, so this is to me the connection between Kerry Thornley and Walter Sheridan. After Townley hung up, he said Sheridan would be in town the following morning. Townley asked me what I wanted for tapes uh, that I had. And I told him 500 bucks. The next morning, he gave me 500 bucks for the tapes and asked me if I would do a film for WDSU consisting of what I know about the Cubans, Ferry Shaw, etc., tape that I sold him contained some information about the clan and other information about the papers that were picked up at the fairy's house. Walter Sheridan is the one who gave me the $500 for the tapes. This $500 was sealed in an envelope and it was all in $100 bills. It's a lot of money in 63. This was given to me in an office in WDSU, uh, which was located by their newsroom. We then went upstairs and they locked the doors and placed a guard on the door and started asking questions and taking pictures of me. I even remember that there was a man from Sweden who was talking to the cameraman and said, uh, asked him to leave. They asked me questions such as, do I know Clay Shaw? Did I ever fly with Clay Shaw and David Ferry? 
see the question about that I ever fly with Clay Shaw and David Ferry is they're asking this because these people I promise you already know about the flights involving Lambert and Diaz. That's why they're asking this to try to confirm because they, these these people already know this. If I knew Gene Davis, that's Eugene Davis. Um, Gene Davis is another person who is known to have used the Clay Bertrand alias. Keep that in mind too. Remember I said aliases are real people whose name gets used to throw off everyone. Um, he asked if I knew Gordon Novell, if I ever worked for the FBI CIA, to which I said yes, uh, of which questions Walter Sheridan said he had already known that I would say yes to. How did Walter Sheridan know that? Because he's CIA also. I was then told to say I didn't know anything that would help Garrison in his investigation, and this was also put on film. I don't remember everything that he told me to say, but he did tell me to go to Canada. He also said that he would edit and cut the film after I was gone. He said that uh, they would get me an attorney if I needed one. I told Sheridan and Townley. And so remember, the, the name, the aliases are shared of real people. So um, I told Sheridan and Townley not to release this film if they were going to cut any part of it. They said that when I got to Canada, they would call me and ask if it could be released. They called my wife later and asked her if she would let them release it, and she told them, no, I understand this film has been cut and released. Mr. Hood told me not to get involved with the district attorney's office, and that district attorney's office tried to subpoena me that they would take care of it. Mr. Hood told me to give all the cooperation necessary to Walter Sheridan required. Sheridan and Townley also told me not to talk with the district attorney's office and to call them right away so that they could get an attorney for me. That's about all I can remember at this time. So Jules Rico Kimball turns out to be a very important person, and as far as just his knowledge of you know, he was in the background. I, I haven't been able to link him to assass the assassination. If he was involved, he probably wouldn't be talking. But uh, what is this? All right, moving on. Memo, January 16th, 1967. The garrison from undercover agent number one. What does it say? It looks like uh, Jimmy J. Johnson. 3330 Louisiana Parkway. That's David Ferry's address. Information on Ferry received by undercover agent number one. Agent number one stated... The attorney that David Ferry spoke to on January 9th, 1967 about being investigated by the district attorney was a young attorney in his 30s, short in stature. About 5'8", this attorney he described had rotten teeth. Hmm. After uh, showing a few photographs of the attorney, he identified G.P. Avrillo as the attorney. Agent number one further stated the number of the airplane which we were interested in was Douglas 88553. This plane is now being kept in Houston, Texas under the supervision of Mr. Pratt. See memo from El Wazel. Agent number one further stated that David Ferry never showed up at the airport on Monday, January 9th, 1967, all day. This was very unusual for him to not let agent number one know about it. Agent number one believes David Ferry is planning a mysterious trip to, the, to an island somewhere south of Florida in the Bahamas. He overheard this being mentioned to Steve Littleton. He also heard Ferry mention that this island has a pretty sandy runway. Stated that they were concerned about not being able to take off from this island uh, with a twin beach airplane. They have to, might have to go with a single engine airplane. It was also mentioned to agent number one by D. Ferry that he is now close to a fellow who is a clerk in one of the courts, doesn't know where, makes about 20000 a year and has a lot of money and a lot of pull, who he's going to buy an airplane from uh, and make big money. Agent number one stated Sunday night, January 8th, 1967, he was requested by David Ferry to borrow his camera to take some pictures. Agent number one was also requested while en route to his home to pick up the camera to stop by the main parking lot of the airport in front of the main building and pick up an 8x10 envelope, which would be under this driver's seat of a white 1964 Chevrolet with no license plates. Agent number one picked up the envelope, which was sealed with scotch tape. He attempted to hold the envelope up to the light and try and ascertain what it contained. He was unable to because whatever was in the envelope was inside two pieces of cardboard. He returned to Ferry's house and gave him the envelope. Ferry would not open the envelope in front of him. This night, he told agent number one that he was going to purchase a new automobile because he just got a hold of some cash. Hmm. Interesting. So Dave Ferry got a bunch of money in January 67. But that could be, I don't know. So I'm going to sidetrack on a story with Dave Ferry. We already talked about his gas service station where we have different witnesses identifying the Al that worked there as uh, Al Bobuf or Al Landry, depending on who you ask. Uh, kind of gave me some kind of inclination that Al Landry was used by, as an alias at some point by Bobuf. Um, but the service station was paid for ultimately by a blackmail 
<laughs> by blackmail to Carlos Marcelo, which I don't understand why David Ferry blackmailed Carlos Marcelo in 1963, late 63, early 64. <laughs> and then he didn't die for three years. Crazy. Like, because you don't blackmail Carlos Marcelo, which is exactly what fucking happened. David Ferry sends a letter to Carlos Marcelo saying, I did all this stuff for you and you fucked me. And he wanted $50,000. And he gets $50,000 from Carlos Marcelo when he opens his service station that lasted nine months and then fucking went out of business, right? So... The more I looked into the death of David Ferry, the less I believed he was murdered, the more I believe he did commit a suicide. Uh, strange, I know, but I believe the pressures on him were so great, he's just like, fuck it, I'm out. <sighs> Agent number one stated that during a conversation with Ferry, it was mentioned that Ferry had been talking to people in district attorney's office. That was after Garrison started his investigation. Agent number one warned him about talking to those people because they were... Because things were hot. Ferry told him, I'm not worried about them. I'm so much smarter than those people. Ferry had also attempted to have agent number one line up some females for him. He wants six females and he's going to pay $15 per hour to take nude pictures of them having intercourse with agent number one. Also other unnatural acts with them and sell them at large price and split half with agent number one. Agent number one knows of two colored females that Ferry has had in his apartment on previous occasions with him, whom he had relations. He only knows them by name. One of the names, Margaret, and the other's name of Schwander. Agent number one also stated that he has seen David Ferry with a spick who either works or owns a service station on Louisiana Avenue and Magazine Street. Another thing he stated was that uh, none of the planes Ferry flies has clearance of the FAA. All right, cool. We're back to Galveston. Back to Galveston. Really irritates me that I can't put the finishing touches on what happened in Galveston. I know the big picture. I, the fine details elude me. It drives me fucking crazy. What does it say up here? Note, within one hour after DF's check-in here, Ruby makes his last ID call for the night calling Breck Wall, who was already arrived in Galveston. False. That's false. The next AM, uh, without any more ID on caller, Ruby goes to the police headquarters and kills Oswald. Okay, so that's another thing. Like, um, part of the reason for the phone call from Breck Wall from, what is it, the Adonis? Was it the Adonis? I forget the name of the hotel. Um, he calls from the hotel that he's living at, and he calls down to Galveston to the house of... Um, it's, it's Robert McEwen, but they give a fake name. Um, Thomas McKenna. They give the name of Thomas McKenna, but that's Robert McEwen. Okay, so um, that's false because Breckwall, when you read through Breckwall's testimony, Breckwall never left fucking Dallas. He never went to Galveston. That was an alibi phone call. Just like the phone calls made between Robert Bernard Baker, Dave Yaris, and Lenny Patrick and Jack Ruby in the days leading up to the assassination. Those are alibi phone calls. This is another alibi phone call. Uh, my guess is that Brecht Wall was actually calling Ruby, not the other way around, because Ruby most certainly made his way to Galveston, and Ruby most probably stayed with Robert McEwen uh, when he was there. So, yeah, any references you read to the Brecht Wall phone call are bullshit. Uh, it's, it's more alibi stuff. And Brecht Wall gets tripped up on the stand when he's testifying. I believe it was the Clay Shaw trial or some deposition. Uh, the motherfucker can't remember the times he made phone the, for this phone call. I mean, it, it's obvious that he didn't know anything about it. Uh, the following investigation was uh, conducted by Carlos L. Kirby at Galveston. On November 28, 63, Mrs. Mary O'Dervy, Clerk Driftwood Motor Hotel, 3128 Seawall Boulevard, Galveston, Texas, Exhibited hotel registration card 38063, which reflected that Melvin Coffey, Alvin Bobo, and David Ferry registered at this hotel at 11 p.m. November 23rd, 1963, and were assigned room 117. They listed their address as 618 North Pierce. So, I finally figured out this address. Um, 618 North Pierce is the real address of Melvin Coffey at the time. But Melvin Coffey's not on this trip. Melvin Coffey is being used as an alias for Leighton Martins. So... They listed the address as 618 North Pierce. They gave Melvin Coffey's address. Records reflected they checked out on November 24th, 63, time not listed. It ended up being in the evening, uh, 7 or 8 o'clock. Mrs. Dovery stated that on November 24th, 63, one of these individuals made a telephone call to Alexandria, Louisiana, and talked three minutes. 
Total charges were $1.05. Goddamn, a three-minute phone call to the next state in 63 costs $1.05. 100 times more expensive than it is today. Hilarious. Uh, the telephone number called at Alexandria is unknown. November 28, 63, Mrs. Shirley Dial, Clark Driftwood Motor Hotel, recalled the above three individuals checked out around 10 a.m. November 24, 63. The above registration card reflects these individuals were driving a Ford station wagon bearing a Louisiana license, 784895. That is the license plate that is supposed to be affixed to David Ferry's light blue Comet station wagon. But here we have the light blue Ford Falcon that was first seen at the Belmont address in Fort Worth and then is identified here. And then is later identified by Thomas Compton as having been the vehicle that left. So we have three distinct references to the light-colored Ford Falcon. It is not the Mercury Comet being accidentally identified. Not three times. Once, maybe. Three times, no fucking way. It's just tradecraft shenanigans. All right, what do these notes here say? An, an observation on an American success story. Note, re, subsequent upward mobility of these four arrivals in Galveston evening of November 23rd, 1963. Dot, dot, in early 64, Ferry and Bobooth jointly open a filling station. Melvin Coffey is hired by NASA at Michaud, space vehicle construction. Breck Wall moves from Dallas to Las Vegas, where he becomes a headliner at the Thunderbird run by Lewis McWillie. Like, this is such, fucking such amazing shit. And they didn't have any idea what this meant back in 1960. What was it, seven at the time when they were doing this investigation? So yeah, everyone got rewarded for their fucking role. You see, Breck Wall went on to be uh, a semi kind of famous, um, like Broadway kind of guy who put on these like gay fucking, you know, the gay musicals that all the fucking that didn't, gay dudes are into, right? Like, that's what he did. It was called... Oh, what the fuck was it called? It's on the tip of my tongue. Um, it was really famous, and it was around for like a decade. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, Brickwall goes on. He's he every all these people got fucking rewarded for their involvement in the assassination. Um, Ferry was not on the trip to Galveston. Bobooth was. Melvin Coffey wasn't, and Brickwall wasn't. But they all got rewarded. All right, so. I'm not sure what this is. Clay Shaw. These look like um, motor vehicle tickets. But um, I think I'm going to wrap it for today. I think I covered everything I wanted to and wrapping up the Winterland and covering it to some connecting stuff. Uh, in the future, we'll do some more shows on Jules Rico Kimball. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, I'm trying to get everyone to sign up on kick.com slash Corey Hughes. Um, and I, uh, I'm trying to hit affiliate there, which means I need 75 followers. Okay. I got 47, which means I need about 28 more people to sign up at kick.com. Uh, anybody who signs up over at kick.com slash Corey Hughes and follows me and then shoots me an email at Corey at Corey Hughes.org. I will send you a pre-order copy of my book package. Um, so please do that. And, uh, what day is today? Saturday, tomorrow we got day zero and I'll be back here Monday morning. Uh, with another episode. Thanks for tuning in. See you guys later.